This podcast is brought to you by the Creation Academy Honors Program, an apologetics learning experience designed to teach, train, and inspire others to become strong defenders of the Christian faith and biblical creation. Launching early 2019, the program offers video and audio training with downloadable course workbooks, expert interviews, and exclusive Q&A sessions with leading creation scientists and apologists, quarterly ebooks covering a wide variety of subject matter, and even a private Facebook community where you'll fellowship and interact with a like-minded community of believers. If you want to be notified when the program goes live and even help us design the experience from the ground up, head on over to www.jointca.co today and sign up for the wait list. You'll get early access to the private Facebook group for free as a thank you for joining. You're listening to the Creation Academy a weekly podcast defending the truth of God's Word in biblical creation science. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Steve Schramm. I'm your host here on the Creation Academy. And this particular lesson starts the beginning of a brand new series. And um, and actually, it starts the beginning of really what's going to be a whole new uh, format for the, for the podcast. And what we're doing, uh, if you missed the announcement on that, is simply we are going to record series of lessons as opposed to just one-off lessons uh, on a weekly basis. Now, these series uh, may still go out on a weekly basis, uh, probably will, um, except with the exception uh, that every now and then we will um, likely take you know, maybe maybe two or three weeks uh, from one series starting to the next, or, or maybe just one week. It really just depends on the prep uh, work on my end, but the way I like to do it is, is have all of the material for a series down before I begin to uh, record it. And so sometimes uh, it's going to work out nicely that way, and sometimes maybe it won't. Uh, but nevertheless, we are going to do the best we can to uh, make it consistent for you. So in this case, uh, I am not starting with the uh, all of the preparatory work done in advance. Uh, but nevertheless, we're going to go ahead and get started. And this week, we are going to be talking about the theology of God's perfect creation. The theology of God's perfect creation. You say, well, what do you mean by that? It sounds kind of like uh, a strange uh, kind of thing to to talk about. And so I guess in one sense it is. Um, But what we want to learn is what the creation itself teaches us about God and who God is, and uh, what um, what kind of nature God has, the way that He interacts with the world. You see, there are things that we can learn from general revelation that tell us about the kind of person that God is, and so that is the nature of the question that we want to look at uh, on today's lesson. So then as we uh, begin to dive into this subject, there are a few categories uh, about uh, God that I think we need to look at. So let's first of all go ahead and begin with the nature of God. What does the creation teach us about the nature of God? Now perhaps the best thing to do would be to come to a, a good understanding of what we mean by the creation. The Bible seems to be describing an event in the first chapter of Genesis that we understand to be creation uh, ex nihilo, that is, creation out of nothing. And uh, certainly, Without going into all of the minutia, this is consistent with even the best findings of modern science today. Um, 
I am not a proponent of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, I'm not a proponent of any of the particular models um, that one may hold um, in relation to the Big Bang Theory. Nevertheless, um, this theory is so widely held um, by the scientific community and is even so much a part of the popular level of understanding of um, cosmogony that it is a a, a very um, useful tool for the Christian apologist. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when we get into important spiritual conversations with people who we are attempting to persuade to consider Christianity, it is not as though we have to argue dogmatically for, well, the age of the earth in general, but certainly we do not have to argue for some sort of particular cosmological understanding of the universe. Uh, It's no secret that there are many many, many Christians who do accept the Big Bang and its um, appropriate uh, time scales, uh, the kind of the whole mixed bag that comes along with it. There are plenty of Christ- of Christians who do accept those things to be true. Now, do I personally hold to those things? No. Um, and I have some sp- spirited conversations uh, sometimes with folks uh, who disagree with me, even within the Christian community. But um, when I am attempting to be persuasive with an unbeliever um, to consider Christianity, and especially when uh, the conversation moves into the realm of apologetics, it is not as though I'm arguing for some young age creationist understanding of the cosmos um, at all. If they don't want to be a young earth, a young earther, or, or they think that's unreasonable, at least at first, fine, we'll deal with those things on the back end. But let's let's start understanding uh, that belief in Jesus is what gets us to heaven, and um, not even what gets us to heaven, even though that is true. But belief in Jesus entails living the life that the creator of not only the cosmos, but also of you, wants you to live. It's being in line with your ultimate purpose. And that directly does not have anything to do with cosmology uh, or cosmogony. But what's interesting is, is the best, uh, you know, attested arguments uh, and theorems for the beginning of a universe, argue strongly for creation out of nothing. That is, creation ex nihilo. So certainly, we are on solid, solid footing. And um, with arguing for creation ex nihilo, and we are not bucking up against any kind of... um, scientific limitations uh, on that. As a matter of fact, this has been argued certainly to be the most reasonable inference. Uh, Even people like Stephen Hawking, who was not willing to affirm the existence or non-existence of God, um, did his best creating theories that would not be dependent on God, and yet um, we find that that is just not the case. Uh, There is no theorem that has been posited that is mathematically and philosophically sound that eliminates the need for a creator. And so we are on good footing arguing this point. So that's what we mean by creation. Uh, We mean to say that the universe has been brought into existence out of no prior existence, uh, quite literally out of nothing. And when we say nothing, we literally mean not anything. In other words, there is a point at which before the beginning of the universe, it is false that anything else existed. That would be a false statement to say that anything existed before the beginning of the universe. And so there's a lot that goes into that. But that's the event that we're talking 
about. Now, if you'll remember, this particular series that we're uh, going through right now is called The Destruction of Paradise. And so it's not really our project here to go deep into an understanding of the creation itself. For example, we're not going to dive into issues like what things were created on what day of, of creation and things like that. What we are concerned with in this particular study is crafting the narrative that led up to the flood event. And in a couple weeks, so not this week and not next week, but the next week, the 16th, uh, which is uh, th- a Thursday, um, that episode will be a break from this series, although it will be related. Uh, you, uh, That is where we will air our interview that we had recently um, with... Um, Mark uh, Lambert uh, over at the Hey Pastor podcast, and um, what we'll be uh, discussing is a flood of evidence, and so we're going to be giving evidence for a global flood in that particular lesson, but we're talking about the destruction of paradise here. We are, the the, the main thrust of, of this entire series is getting down to the bottom of why God used a global flood to destroy this earth a little over 4,000 years ago. And so this is kind of a very theological um, a project, and nevertheless, we're going to be dealing with a lot of the science interspersed here throughout. Uh, but th- So what we are focusing on then is we want to understand some things about the nature of God some things um, also about the nature of humanity, some things about the historicity of humanity, um, things like what was so special about Noah and what was so bad about everybody else. And so those are the kind of questions that we're interested in um, in this particular study. So the first thing we want to learn about them is we want to learn about the God who started all of this. The God who brought the cosmos into being and then for some reason just a couple thousand years in decided that humanity had become unbearable, to put it one way. And the the best course of action, remember God always does what's best because by definition, if the greatest maximally being in the universe or the maximally greatest, uh, I don't know the best way to put that, but uh, the greatest possible being, let's put it like that, in the universe decides something, then by definition, whatever that is, is the best course of action. And so the best course of action for some reason was to destroy all of humanity with the exception of Noah and his family. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in a few weeks, we're going to talk about that and figure out why it is that God decided to bestow his grace upon Noah. But for today, we want to learn about that God. So we're going to go quickly through the notes here that I have made uh, about um, God and what the creation itself teaches us about God. Now, not the Bible. There, we, we are not going to discuss Bible verses in this particular study because that is a, a matter of special, well, I shouldn't say in this particular study, but in this particular lesson, um, we're not going to be discussing Bible verses because that deals with special revelation. Now, certainly the Bible is our highest authority, but we're interested today in what we can learn about God simply through what has been revealed to the creation. And so I think this will be very interesting for you. So first is the nature of God. The nature of God. First of all, we want to say that God is maximally great. All right, now that is to say that he is the um, summum bonum. He is the highest good. He is uh, the greatest conceivable being in the universe, because if there were a being that were greater than he, uh, then that would be the greatest possible being in the universe. And so, um, 
and a, a, a pretty elementary question when people are first starting to ask important questions about God, and this question is actually very popular among children, is they might want to ask, well, who made God? And to ask such a question um, would be incoherent. That is not uh, based on what we mean by our definition of God. We can't ask the question, who made God? Because God is a maximally or the maximally great being. And the nature of such a being is such that there is no being greater than that. So that is what we mean by God. And if you're interested in it, we can't get into it today because it's pretty technical. Um, actually, it's very technical. But there's a an argument called the ontological argument for the existence of God. And um, frankly, I think that it's a, a pretty sound and solid argument. And so I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, Dr. William Lane Craig has some excellent information on that, the ontological argument for the existence of God. So I would certainly uh, look into that, and that will help you to understand the concept of a maximally great being, and um, of course why we feel that that is something that could be uh, confidently applied to the God of the Bible as the creator of the cosmos. Okay, we also learn from nature that God is immaterial. Now, how do we infer that from nature? Of course, we know that Scripture says that God is a spirit. Uh, No man has seen him uh, at any time. We learn those things about God from special revelation. But what does the creation teach us? Well, you see, there can be no such thing as eternal matter. And uh, there are a number of scientific and philosophical reasons Uh, for that. Uh, From a philosophical perspective, for example, it is impossible to transverse an actual infinite. That is, if you have an infinite um, set of possible scenarios and circumstances um, that we are living in, then today would not be here. Because it's infinite in the past. It would have already passed. There There is no such thing as today in the um in the sense of eternality uh, as it refers to time okay we're not talking about the um necessary existence or the eternality of god we're talking about matter it is impossible for matter to be eternal from a philosophical perspective because you cannot transverse an actual infinite today would have never got here so eternal matter is impossible. It's also impossible from a scientific perspective. All of the best knowledge that we have about science, the best proved laws of thermodynamics, for example, um, the first and second law, uh, cohesively, when applied together, uh, give us the understanding that there was a time at which all of the energy in the universe began winding down. However, that and that's taught by the by the second law, and that's a very simplistic way of putting it. But essentially, it is the law of increasing entropy, or um, the uh, law of increasing disorder. Essentially, there are less and less um, organized states of things, um, states of atoms, arrangements of atoms that uh, are. Uh, moving from one state to the next as time winds down. And every bit of evidence we have points to the fact that at one point, it was uh, the, the universe was at a point where the maximum amount of energy, or the full amount of energy, I guess we should say, uh, was there. And we've been winding down ever since. But the first law of thermodynamics says that uh, matter and energy, things like that, cannot be created or destroyed. In other words, there is not a natural known mechanism at all which would create something new. All you can possibly do is reorganize already existing matter. But we know that matter cannot be eternal. And so therefore, we have to have um, something prior to matter existing something or someone, perhaps we could say with a capital S, uh, that 
must have brought everything into existence. Everything that we understand to be matter and energy today, um, none of these things could have been eternal for the scientific and philosophical reasons I mentioned. And so therefore, whatever existed prior to this state to bring about the universe must have been immaterial. It must have been immaterial. And uh, one could not say, uh, perhaps they could at a time before uh, before Einstein had done his work, which eventually led to the theory of general relativity. Um, but prior to that time, it might have been common for one to say, well, the universe just is. It just, it doesn't matter. We don't know why it's here. We don't even know what the universe really is. Um, this is all just uh, meaningless speculation. But indeed, with the introduction of the Big Bang Theory, even if one does not hold to it, it has become massively evident with further studies in modern science, including the laws of thermodynamics and uh, general relativity and things of that nature. It has become quite clear uh, that you can't just dismiss the kind of origin that the universe had. Every piece of evidence we have points to a beginning point in the universe, and yet we know that matter and energy cannot create itself uh, because uh, something must be in existence uh, if it's going to somehow create another version of itself, uh, even if that were possible. And so to say that the universe created itself is a meaningless statement. That, that, that is not something that is possible. And so we can infer from all of this that there was a creation to the universe, um, you know, supposedly or, um, or or most likely involving a creator, a someone to create. And that someone must, by definition, be immaterial. So we've already learned these things about God, that God is a maximally great being, and God is immaterial. And these are things we've learned without even consulting a Bible. God is also transcendent. Um, and this kind of builds on the things that we have just been talking about, but simply, he has always existed. He is before time itself, and he is separate from his creation. And this particular a quality or aspect of God is something that drastically separates him from every other understanding of uh, of creators of of, of deity um, of 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 um, of gods with creative force in the ancient Near Eastern culture in which Moses found himself crafting um, these uh, chapters of the Bible and. Um, so John Oswalt on this point, uh, he is an Old Testament scholar who we quote from time to time. He says this, quote, for the Bible, God is not the cosmos and the cosmos is not God. God is radically other than his creation. This thought undergirds everything the Bible says about reality. From start to finish, the Bible adamantly resists the principle of continuity. God and the divine realm are not in any way a part of this world. He is everywhere present in the world, but he is not the world, and the world is not him. He is other than the world. He is separate from it, and it does not proceed from him as a somewhat blurred reflection. It is a creation that by his permission has a distinct existence from his own. This is the law of transcendence, and it means that God is wholly other than the cosmos, end quote. And what he is getting at here, and I'm not going to give you a whole synopsis of his book, but generally speaking, every ancient Near Eastern culture wrote from a worldview of continuity. That is, uh, when they were des describing gods, they were talking about gods. These gods were often created to objects that, or, or excuse me, often associated today with things like the sun 
and the moon, so objects or forces such as uh, wind, uh, things like thunder and lightning, things of that nature. And uh, what we find in the Bible is something radically different than any one of those. What we find is a God who is transcendent, who transcends time, space. He's not bound, in other words, by time, space, matter. Indeed, he is the very creator of those things and preexisted them because God is a necessary being. And if that's tough to wrap your head around, uh, welcome to the club. That's tough for many people to wrap their head around. But it certainly is the more reasonable um, explanation than to just say that something could come out of nothing. Uh, because this would truly be worse than, than magic. Uh, worse than magic. All right. So we find that God is maximally great, immaterial, transcendent, and he is also authoritative. And this seems like an obvious point, but once we've got to this point, we can then understand that God is authoritative. If, if he created this world, then he owns it. He has all authority over his creation. He creates, uh, again, ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing. And we find when we read the Bible, of course, that he commands the cosmos via spoken word. And so it's almost axiomatic then to understand that uh, whatever one creates, one has ownership of. And we realize and affirm this concept, of course, in our everyday life. Uh, this is the whole principle behind copyright law and trademarks and things of that nature. When you create something, it is your ownership. Now, of course, there are uh, concepts in the Bible where uh, a, a specific concept I'm thinking of is called stewardship, where God essentially appoints managers to uh, to have dominion over and to overtake and to, to steward the creation for God, to manage it for God. But that does not make us owners. And so the dominion mandate, for example, uh, in the first chapters of Genesis, where God gives Adam the uh, authority or the dominion over the earth and the creatures of the earth, he is acting on behalf of God. He is a manager for God's creation, not the owner of it, for the only possible owner could be God. And then we find that God is a God who makes distinctions. He makes distinctions. Um, there is a difference between me and the microphone that I am speaking into. Now, that seems intuitively obvious, but if you think about it in the first chapter of Genesis, you find God making clear distinctions with things. In other words, in the principle of continuity I mentioned a while ago, everything is weaved together. God, uh, the cosmos, you and I, we are all part of this uh, continuous reality uh, wherein we can identify with one another on a level radically different than what we can do today. We often say that we could identify with somebody. What we mean by that is not the same thing that is meant by a worldview of continuity. We have a God who makes distinctions. He names things. He names the day and the night. He names the man and the woman. He gave man the authority to name the animals. And this is demonstrative of um, authority. And of course, we don't find specifically about naming until we get into the, into the special revelation, into the Bible. But we understand, looking at the world, that things are different from one another. The sun and the moon are two distinct things, and they are distinct from the earth. Uh, they are distinct from the other stars that we find. Uh, we are not, uh, contrary to what some cosmologists, especially popular guys, want to argue, we are not stardust. We are other than the cosmos. We are other than the stars. We are other than each other. We are distinct individual beings, individual creations. And so we find that God makes distinctions over things and has authority over them. He creates using diversity. He made different kinds of animals. He made them on different days. He made them with the ability to adapt and change into um, um, uh, not other versions of themselves, but to, to mutate functions of their being and features of their being according to what habitat they are in. He made his creation with the ability to change and adapt to the things that are around it. 
So we have a God who makes distinctions and uh, allows change within the creation, albeit at the same time, he himself does not change. And that is the final thing we want to mention with respect to the nature of God, that he is consistent. Uh, We have laws, natural laws, and even physical constants which seem to suggest that God creates and demands order. Within God's creation, uh, we, uh, while there is something called chaos theory, um, we understand that, generally speaking, the universe is not um, a state of chaos. There are laws that govern our universe. There are moral laws within each one of us. The Bible does say that it is written on the heart of every man, but there is something about it that we understand that certain things are just objectively wrong. Now, one may choose to deny that when they're um, on guard, defending their philosophical pre-commitments, okay? But um, looking at the issue from the standpoint of, you know, being honest with yourself, we all realize that murder is wrong. We all realize that certain things are objectively wrong in every case, no matter the situation. Of course, there are those who are going to deviate from that, um, and these are what we call psychopaths. And that is because the moral function that they have, or that we all have, is not working in that person. That is a deficiency. That is a problem that they have. Uh, But the exception proves the rule. The point is, because there are psychopaths, uh, that there are, uh, that there is a genuine objective moral standard that we all want to affirm. And so that teaches us about our creator. That teaches us that God is, in fact, consistent. Okay, secondly... And quickly, we have the ability of God. The ability of God. Um, God is omnipotent. And I've adapted these particular three from Dr. Kurt Wise because I really like his descriptions of this. So we're just going to read them and reflect on them verbatim from his book, Faith, Form, and Time. So God is omnipotent. God has, in other words, all power. I quote, If our experience is correct, complexity increases in systems only with an external energy source, a proper energy conversion mechanism, and a design. In light of the second law of thermodynamics, the universe at its origin must have had a lot of usable energy, a lot more than it has now. The second law suggests that usable energy is lost in every energy transfer. As a result, the amount of energy available in the energy source is always observed to be greater than the amount of energy given away. If the same principle is applied to the origin of the universe, the cause of the universe had more energy than the total amount of energy in all the universe. It also had the ability to transform that energy into a usable form. It thus has the ability to control all of the energy of the universe, meaning that it has all power. Now, how is that for a scientific definition of omnipotence? It's hard to imagine that, but if you think about it, the one who has the power to create the universe, understanding, of course, as we do, that the universe is everything, It is literally everything that is in existence. That means God has more power than everything that is in existence, which by definition is omnipotence. Okay, but then we also realize from nature and from creation that God is omniscient. This means that he is all-knowing. So in our experience, I'm quoting again, information is lost in every transfer of information. This means that the amount of information in the source is always greater than the amount of information transferred. Applied to the origin of the universe, the information possessed by the cause of the universe must have been greater than the total amount of information placed into the universe. This would suggest that the cause of the universe had more information than is found in the universe meaning that it had all 
knowledge. And then finally, from nature, we can also infer that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent. Quote, Since it was independent of matter, the cause of the universe seems to have been non-physical. Since it was independent of space, the cause of the universe seems to be both outside the universe and at every place within the universe. Transcendent. Imminent. All present. Since it was independent of physical time, the cause of the universe seems to be unchanging, always present, and eternal. So, in many ways, what we see here in these attributes of God, his, his power and his knowledge and his presence, we actually have supporting scientific information for the things that we um, um, learned that we can infer from nature about God in the from the nature uh, of God in the very beginning. So uh, we find this incredible support. Everything we know about modern science, about modern information science, uh, about um, physics, everything we know directly points to a perfect, timeless, immaterial, unchanging creator. But it gets even better. You see, we also have the direction of God. Um, the creation account, now this is something that we understand from Scripture, uh, but this is also, and again, I am not, uh, I am not um, arguing for uh, evolution here in any sense, but I want you to understand this general, general concept from the general to the specific. For example, um, young age creationists like us understand that um, in the beginning, God created kinds of animals. And we understand that today we can break that down further, um, the classifications of created kinds. And, um, of course, the, um, the term most widely recognized by the wider scientific community would be a species. We all kind of can understand in our minds what a species is. But on young age creationism, these were created kinds in the beginning, and so they are general. They were loaded with DNA, uh, with more genetic information and variety than what we have today. So as creation goes through time, and as organisms change, we find things moving from the general to the specific. We also find this mirrored in the creation account. Um, things move from more general terms to the specific as God goes through and creates uh, the cosmos first and then essentially dials down into eventually the creation of man. So we see that that uh, there is a direction uh, to God, or or what we're meaning to say here is the direction of God. There is a purpose that uh, God has as the creator of the cosmos. Notably, when we do consider the actual creation account in the Bible, we find that the conclusion of God's creative work ends by crafting us by crafting man in God's very own image. We were created, it seems, under this understanding, to live forever in communication and fellowship with God. And of course, we find that all things were created by him and for his glory. In Revelation 4.11, so this is a scriptural confirmation of what we can learn just by looking at nature, that there is a direction, a pattern, a purpose. And we all, I mean, I listen to, to tons of stuff from helpful, uh, helpful people who believe it is their purpose in life to help others realize their purpose in life. And so this, this concept of purpose is deeply tied to the human project, to, to the human understanding of reality. And so it only makes sense to infer from that and also from what we see in nature, the moving from the general to the specific, that there is a direction, a purpose. Uh, uh, philosophers often talk about the uh, arrow of time. Time has a direction. Time has a purpose. Um, this is something that we understand by looking at nature. Now, of course, 
the fall of man marred this image of God that God created in us. And so God's original intent uh, for creation was, of course, marred. But new intent has been established. Uh, in fact, Luther said it this way, quote, Now the very intent of the gospel is to restore this image of God. Man's intellect and will have indeed remained, but wholly corrupted. The divine object of the gospel is that we might be restored to that original and indeed better and higher image, an image in which we are born again unto eternal life, or rather unto the hope of eternal life by faith, in order that we might live in God and with God and might be one with him. That is, he shall be a spiritual man, in which state he shall return to the image of God, for he shall be like unto God in life, righteousness, holiness, wisdom, etc. End quote. And so what we see here is this purpose of God being manifested in creation and confirmed by um, the scriptures. And that reflection from Luther seems to indicate that when we talk about salvation, when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about the gospel, we are talking about the ultimate purpose of God being accomplished. So yes, God has a direction. He has a purpose. He has a plan which he is working out within the human historical um, timeline and understanding of the world. And then, uh, lastly, we have the personhood of God. The personhood of God. I'm interested in the concept of choice. Now, there is a huge theological debate as to just how much, if any, choice humans have to do anything. Uh, nevertheless, we can all break bread together and affirm that God is a God who can make choices. There are some that want to say that God is the only one who can make choices, which I personally disagree with. But the fact of the matter is that God is a God who made a choice. How do we know that? Well, because simply put, he made a choice to create. God brought this world into existence. And so therefore, he made a choice. It did not happen randomly or by itself because it could not have happened randomly or by itself as we've already seen. There was a choice to create. And the only thing that can make choices is those beings, the only kinds of things maybe I should say that can make choices are the kinds of things, the kinds of beings that are more than matter. They have a mind. They are personal agents. They have agency. Okay, so uh, that is the nature of choice, and only persons make choices. The language of DNA also seems to suggest that creation was the product of a mind. We know, uh, in, in good information science, we know of absolutely nothing other than a mind that is capable of producing new information, capable of producing um, language, capable of, of, of communicating, capable of being able to give instructions and have another to follow out on those instructions or even to have a machine follow up on those instructions. We know of no other source of this kind of information other than a mind. And the only kinds of things uh, with minds are beings. They are persons. They are personal. The ability to communicate itself suggest that the creator desires communication with his creator. In other words, we have these language conventions. We understand that we can speak to one another and be understood. And in some cases, we can even speak multiple languages and be understood. And so it seems to um, suggest that whoever created this world, whoever created this universe, wanted deeply to be in communication and relation with his creation. And the only things that can communicate, the only kinds of things that communicate are persons, personal agents. And so God is therefore personal. He has uh, 
properties of personhood, the manifestation of Jesus, which did happen in human historical time. Whether or not there was a Bible to tell us about it, uh, this is the way things happened. Um, And, of course, the miraculous evidence of his resurrection suggests that God is personal. God showed the ultimate form of personhood by becoming a person just like he created in the beginning. And finally, we understand that the universal emphasis of the earth and the inability of life's existence across the rest of the cosmos uh, suggests that God has specially created this planet for those who have been made in his image. The standard is hardly undeniable when we understand that today naturalistic evolution theory must depend on the fact that information can come uh, from something other than a mind. And nevertheless, we spend millions of dollars on expensive and costly time, uh, time, um, I don't want to say time wasting, but time consuming resources to try to find life other than ours in this universe. And the standard for the pattern of intelligence, the pattern of communication that we are looking for from some other kind of intelligence is incredibly, incredibly low. I mean, I'm talking about beeps and blips and patterns that we're looking for in the far reaches of space. And yet the language of DNA, which sits right under our nose and our lab uh, material each and every week, this is brushed off as the result of natural processes. In fact, some have uh, argued that it is more likely that this DNA is the product of aliens that at some time seeded our area of the cosmos then uh, to be um, that of information produced by an eternal mind such as God. Well, if nothing else today, hopefully you have seen what all can be learned about God just from creation. And maybe you've never considered this before. Uh, But this is why Romans 1 talks about the fact that we will be without excuse, all of us one day, when we stand before a creator. Uh, On my personal persuasion, this information that we can find is not enough to attain salvation. And I think that is backed up clearly by Acts chapter 10 and the account of Peter and Cornelius. And we're not going to rehash that today. But in that particular case, we do seem to see where just knowing and even worshiping God was not quite enough. Cornelius needed to know about Jesus. And so I don't think that we can find sufficient evidence in the cosmos alone for our salvation. But I do think that we find sufficient evidence for our condemnation because God has said that he has made it so obvious to his creation that he is the creator and that one day we're going to stand before him in judgment and we will have no excuse for not bowing the knee to the God who created everything. And as we've seen today, just what we can infer about God from the nature of our universe, it can hardly be said that there is no evidence in the cosmos for God. It can hardly be said that there is a better explanation for the way that the world really is than the God of the Bible. And so that is where we plant our flag, and that's where we stand. That is the theology of God's perfect creation. In the beginning, when God made all of this, it was perfect. By definition, when a maximally great being creates something, it is perfect. But we understand that the reason why the world today is not perfect is because God gave us a free will. In other words, God gave us the ability to choose imperfection. And it's my commitment or my understanding that true love could not have been accomplished any other way. 
one may say that they love God in a universe where God has manif- manufactured that that love, uh, but it would not be genuine, true love in the sense that we understand it. God uh, uh, imposes on us the ability to be able to choose Him or to deny Him. That's my personal understanding of of Scripture and of creation. And when we choose ourselves, when we choose our own pride instead of God, and when that happened in the garden, that is sin. The ultimate sin is rejecting our ultimate purpose. Deviation from the standard. Deviation from the ultimate purpose. That is the best definition of sin. Sin is missing the mark. And we've all missed the mark. Romans 3.23 says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we understand this. We identify with this. And we can be restored to that perfection. And the Bible says that one day that day is in fact coming when everything will be restored to that Edenic state, to that state when God originally created everything. But we find here a God who is loving. He is personal. He uh, has a direction. He has a purpose. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He is um, omnipresent. He's maximally great, immaterial, transcendent, authoritative. He makes distinctions, and indeed, he is consistent. He is always constant. And so we learn these things about God and about God's creation. Somewhere along the way, something went wrong. So next week, uh, we are going to uh, have an interview with Dr. Edgar Andrews from the UK, and he has just finished a a, a book, which I have not got to dive into yet, but I'm really excited to, um, called What is Man? Adam, Alien, or Ape? And we're going to discuss the historicity of Adam so that we can get an understanding for why the Bible treats uh, the person of Adam is so important and what makes him so important to uh, understanding uh, the human project and to really getting to the bottom um, of why it is that God decided to ultimately destroy paradise, ultimately with the flood. Of course, we realized that by that time it was not paradise, uh, but that's the discussion of next week, why we lost that paradise uh, and why it matters for us. Let's say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the way in which your world so obviously reflects back on your word. And we thank you for the ability of, of, of being able to choose you and to choose to love you. We thank you for loving us, of course, before we loved you. Because we know that had you not loved us, the ability to love would just not be possible. So we want to say that we love and appreciate you, just God, for being who you are. If you never did anything for us, Lord, you would still be God. And we ought to love you and appreciate you, just for the person that you are. Thank you for uh, teaching us about yourself in the cosmos and in uh, your creation, in the creation of man, even the creation of Uh, of animals, everything, the whole creation testifies to you. The heavens declare the glory of God, sure enough. We thank you, Lord, for being you. In Jesus' name, we do humbly ask this prayer. Amen. Well, uh, thank you again for joining me this week on the Creation Academy. I'm really excited about this new uh, series that we're going into, about this new format with series and interviews and things. I think it's going to be really interesting, going to kind of bring a whole new light and a whole new life to the podcast. Of course, don't forget to head over to www.jointca.co. That's www dot join tca dot co where you can learn more about the honors program if you want to go deeper than just what can be learned here on the creation academy uh, podcast and go on into the uh, what we call the honors program which is uh, what you heard about in the very beginning of the lesson i invite you to 
go there. And to get signed up for the wait list, it's again launching early 2019 and we're so excited about the progress we're making so far. We've got a pretty sure direction now uh, on what we're going to be doing. Um, hey, listen, if, if you are interested in volunteering to do some research work, I can't guarantee anything, um, but there's a possibility that this volunteer work could turn into uh, a more full-time uh, income position. So I am looking right now for three um, applicants, uh, looking for three positions to be filled with people who I feel would do a good job um, to do research for uh, the content that we're going to be creating for the Creation Academy. If you've always wanted to contribute to a ministry like this, but you don't feel that you have the ability or the resources to create the podcast or write the articles or do those things, then this is a great opportunity. If you could just do some research, it's not going to be a ton of work, and uh, I can explain that to you if you um, if you contact me. Um, but uh, I would really love to talk to you if you think this is the kind of thing that you would be interested in. And in fact, if you can write, that's even better because I would be interested in you in you helping me to develop uh, some manuscripts and things of that nature. So um, contact me, reach out to me, steve at steveshram.com, uh, steve at steveshram.com. Uh, and you can reach me through my website uh, if that would be easier, Facebook, Twitter, all those things, I'm on there. Um just reach out to me. Let me know that you're interested in becoming a um, research assistant for uh, the honors program, and uh, we'll talk, and um, maybe we can uh, put something together. Okay? So thank you so much for joining us this week here on the Creation Academy. Hope you'll uh, join me next week as we interview Dr. Edgar Andrews. We're excited about that. We're excited about um, learning about the historicity of Adam uh, from a very, very influential uh, figure. And so it's going to be really fun and exciting. And he's British, so that's pretty cool too. All right, thank you so much for joining me this week. We'll see you next week. Thank you and bye-bye.